one of the first guests on the channel has returned. Ted Coleman will be here, and we are going to talk about one of his favorite movies for this animation celebration, that being The Nightmare Before Christmas. When After the open rolls, we're going to break it down. Our thoughts on the movie. Ted, welcome back. It's been too long. As a matter of fact, since last you were on the channel, you have your own channel. Yes, I do. That being the Cracked Skull Podcast. Tell them all about it. I, we're whiskey, laughter, bullshit, man. Uh, just a group of guys getting together, drinking some whiskey, smoking some cigars, and whatever comes to mind, we throw out there. We've had you on um, a while back now. Uh, been a couple months. But yes, sir. Um, yeah, we're rolling strong and, you know, starting to do some new things, so. Yeah, you are, uh, quite popular with the, uh, the drinking crowd. I, yep, we try to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, no, I, I love collabs, whether it be your channel or others. And, you know, I look forward to Tony's introduction to the channel whenever that, yep. that day comes. Um, but because... I don't really drink on this channel. We are uh, we're having the the drinking and smoking boys do my thing, which is in this case a movie review of one of Ted's well his favorite things, <laughs> uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas. It's only a few of my favorite things. <laughs> exactly. So it came out in 1993 and it ran one hour eleven minutes. I've got to say right off the bat, I love the fact that it didn't run an hour and a half or two hours, three hours, all these people or folks that make movies that think, oh, this is my magnum opus, I'm going to sit you down for eight hours. I'm like, uh, guys, you know you can just tell a story and uh, move move right along. Yeah, and that, that's one of the nice things about what he does with his movies is he doesn't really care, like, you know, yes, they're, they're great looking, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, Tim Burton is actually phenomenal in making you not only see the story but all the other little pieces that go into everything else that he's done in that movie absolutely yeah um yeah I, i'm just like i said I'm, I'm i'm a fan of getting in and getting done yeah but another thing i was impressed with upon my rewatch of the movie was the the reveal of Jack Skellington. I just thought it made him feel big time when you first see him and it's just like Oh yeah, like, from, from from transition of Pumpkin King to actually to actual Jack Skellington. Exactly, yeah. You know, setting him on fire. Yeah. And that's actually that's one of my favorite fun codes that I own too. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Which is saying just, a lot given just Jack Skellington <laughs> pumpkin head and all in flink, yeah. I was gonna say that's that's saying a lot given your uh, uh, my, my huge collection, yes. And the say. bulk of it being all nightmare before Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I, I was gonna ask if if it was the majority because I would have assumed that was Yeah, the case. it uh, that is at least thirty to forty pieces of it. And, and is that, that's how it began, too, right? Yeah, it I began thought. with two right before Christmas ones. That's what's uh, up. It began with a uh, Akari, let's see, it's about this tall, and then Dr. Finkelstein. Okay. Dr. Finkelstein. So I kept calling him Victor Frankenstein stand-in. So, okay. So, basically, think about it like this with Finkelstein. Finkelstein is essentially Frankenstein's monster. Mm-hmm. Who then creates... His own monster sure. in creating Sally, but then creates himself monster. He, a wife, yeah. again by creating a female version of himself right. that he splits his brain with. <laughs> I, I, I definitely thought the uh, splitting the brain oh, yeah. idea was a lot of fun. I just like to be able to open up my skull and just go, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, brain itched. <laughs> brain itched, yeah. Um, but yeah, when when we got to that place, which is significantly into the film, obviously, I was just like, man, that's it's quite the intriguing proposition. 
uh, to, to think about like, Hey, is it, mm-hmm. is that, is that the best way to have good company is to put half your brain in well, and, and another vessel? I there's like also that. a really cool thing with Nightmare Before Christmas, which is, um, so it's been, it's been theorized, but you know, it, it's pretty solid. If What's you up? look at different movies that Tim Burton's done throughout the years. Yes. So yes. we started with Nightmare Before Christmas. Okay. Then we went backwards and we got Frankie and Weenie. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's zero. I, I have seen that on the internet. Then you go back and you go to system. Corpse Bride. Yeah. That is Jack and that's Sally. You oh. know, it, it, it kind of... So if true, I don't I don't know if it's been verified or not, but, you know, it's definitely a fun idea. But I was going to say, if true, I think that it helps clarify the magnetism of the characters. Well, and that's one thing that Tim Burton does. He's not going to tell you right out of the gate. He'll probably never tell us if, if that was ever his design, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it... It lines up, yeah, exactly. Fits going like through, <laughs> and uh, and just the idea of things fitting is fitting, because there are so many fun gags throughout. <clears throat> like, and and I think my favorite go to gag in the film is the mistake of calling Santa Claus Sandy, Sandy Claus. <laughs> Sandy Claus, exactly. I I thought that was very. Amusing because it's it's also a very believable mistake to make. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> much like how that I didn't catch Finkelstein's name and just was like, oh, he's the Victor <laughs> Frankenstein stand. I was like, hey, close enough. Right, gets the uh, gets the point across. Right, when yeah. I said, and, and especially yeah. when he, he has the 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 helper named Igor, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that mm-hmm. my my initial assumption is accurate. Mm-hmm. And then you you know, there's a lot of the characters that people don't even realize the names for, like. Um, you've got the giant hulking thing with the axe in his head. Mm-hmm. Behemoth. Behemoth, okay. Behemoth. There you yeah. go. So, I mean, there's like there's a whole set of characters that... It's a mythos, yeah. ...we were introduced to, and the more you watch it, the more you, you just keep watching and watching and watching, and you're like, oh, there's that, you know, um, the forest scene. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. With all the, the trees with all the, and the doors. Yep. Yep. And not everybody catches all the other doors. They're just like, oh, yeah, there's okay, there's a door with a Christmas tree on it and one with... Yeah, Easter Bunny. Right, why yeah. didn't anybody catch... Why... Turkey, I think. What, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's all the holidays, guys. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, um, so with that recognition of all the holidays, it almost made me wonder if there was ever an intent to to revisit the world and and step through those other portals. I don't know if that was ever uh, it, talked about, but if it, I remember it right, seems like it could be If I be remember done. right, Tim Burton did say something at one point about he was not against it, but it wasn't the original. Mm. Like, he was pretty much, like, done. Yeah. Like, that was that was where it was. Yeah, sure. But which, now us fans are going... It would kind of be cool if, you, if we saw them, you know, maybe yeah. another, not even just necessarily A Nightmare Before Christmas, right? Mm-hmm. But another movie where a little There's bit of crossover. crossing yes. into another Crossing the streams, holiday. if you will. Yeah. Right, exactly, <laughs> you know. And, and something that maybe, you know. And I think I think that, that actually is maybe the better pitch. Mm-hmm. Like, um, instead of necessarily hopping on to the ones that we know, uh exploring the universe via other characters. So, yeah, no, I just, I don't know, it was just an observation. Yeah, given. I, I, I was, I, I actually always wanted them to do, I always wanted them to do another one. I was like, all right, now it would be really cool if we had, you know, just Jack going and messing around with the Easter Bunny for, you know, funsies, oh, you know? I do think the Easter Bunny scene is one of the more fun uh, ideas because the, they called them the Boogie Boys. Uh, like Shock like, and Barrel. Exactly, um... When they are instructed to to steal or kidnap Sandy Claus, and they bring back the Easter Bunny, I thought that was one of the more uh, amusing mistakes to make. Because again, when your whole universe revolves around a singular day, uh, or in this case, singular holiday, of course, things will not be clear to you as to what other significance characters have because mm-hmm. um and th- that's that's a lot of the fun of the world within Halloween Town is their their disbelief or uh, lack of understanding for the other communities and <laughs> so yeah I just I thought that was 
a, a, a fun way to demonstrate the the character's understanding. Oh yeah, yeah, and um, there's actually so this one's this gets a little weird. Um, I don't know how much diving you did into oh, so some here's, characters. I will tell you this for sure. I did zero dives. All I did was I watched the movie, and that, that's how I do with everything. So I watched the the product itself, and then I notate what I did yes. or did not enjoy. So keep that in mind. Whether it's your first time here or you're a regular here at Mr. Super Raz, I just want to thank you for tuning in to the channel. It exists because I, Oz, from the channel Mr. Super Oz, I wrote a 68-page graphic novel called Everlasting Survivors. Volume 1 is called All Day Long. If you follow the link in the description of this video, you can get yourself hats, shirts, posters, all kinds of fun things. But most importantly, you can get the story itself. And the more people that pick up the story, the greater the chances are that there can be continued adventures with these heroes. Thank you. After that, open rolls. Enjoy the video. If you could, give it a like. Subscribe if you haven't already. Leave a comment. Enjoy. So yeah, tell me all about your your deep lore to the universe. So there's a twisted theory. Yes, I'm ready. On Lock, Shock, and Barrel. Okay, what is it? So, if you notice, when Lock, Shock, and Barrel take off their mask... It's still their same face underneath. Correct. Yeah, I did notice that. Their mask is meant to be exactly how they died. Really? Okay. One of them drowned. Hmm. One of them electrocuted. One of them, uh, and I've got a freaking, I think one of them died either by, like, asphyxiation. But yeah, that's, it's supposed to be how, that's like their death mask. Oh, okay. That they're actually wearing. That... That's why, you know, barrels are... Yeah. Because he, that's how he died. Gotcha. Yeah. It's twisted on that, like, that's the, but I wouldn't put it past Tim Burton. Yeah. Right? That's the type of, you know, director that he is, the type of creator that he is. He creates these fantastically dark worlds that have so much going on in them, and there's so many things that you don't realize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, that spans his entire catalog. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I uh, like I said, I never go past the specific thing. Mm -hmm. If if I know more about it, like a like a Batman, for instance, it's not due to doing research for the film. It's because I was already invested. Yeah, and and due to my lack of investment within this film. So I'd seen it once before. Right, I mean, I'm an old school fan. I'm a fan from day one to, you know, here we are now. <laughs> and that's, that's what I was going to say. Is that's the beauty of this review is it's two separate perspectives. Mm -hmm. Me, like I said, I've watched it the second time, the second time I took notes. And in your case, I don't... 220 second time? <laughs> there you go. I was going to say, I didn't know if it was numerable, but yeah, you I, go. I lost track? <laughs> I, I believe you. Like, so it's, and for me, and for our household even... It's, we celebrate everything Halloween, mm -hmm. right? That's like numero uno <laughs> as far as holidays go in our household. I like that. Um, but when it comes down to Nightmare Before Christmas, it's it's our Halloween movie, it's our Thanksgiving movie, it's our, you know, Christmas movie. Yeah, and I was going to say, that's, <laughs> that is actually one of the appeals, I feel like, of the film, is that it, it does have longevity beyond Halloween. Mm -hmm. And be uh, it, it basically runs the gambit. It can be pre Halloween, it can be post Halloween, it can be pre Christmas, it can be during Christmas. It's like it just it hits uh, the sweet spot well, that I, most most holiday films don't. And there's always been that there's always been that you know argument: is it a Halloween movie or is it a Christmas movie? Yes. And it, I'm, I'm sitting here going, it's both. I, and exactly, I think it's, that it is, starts out with Halloween, it ends with Christmas. While still being a Halloween because Jack goes, okay, Halloween's over. We've got 364 days till next year's Halloween. And then, well, the mayor tells us says that, but... I know what you mean. And then he goes, screw this. I want another holiday. I'm not done yet. I'm <laughs> going after Christmas because he finds it. Yes. And then he goes, you know what? It's in my game. <laughs> I'm not meant for this. I'm going back to being Halloween. We're gearing up for Halloween. So, it, it, you well, know... I, it's uh, like, meh, meh. So, the... 
I think that his uh, revelation, his awakening to being a Halloween guy, the king, uh, Pumpkin King. I mean, it only took a howitzer. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was going to say is I think that it might be my favorite scene in the movie because, um, because of the idea that tradition and or in this case what you know is good and mm -hmm. while also you know branching out trying new things going a different direction also good and i just i thought that was it was it was intriguing and i i liked it the in execution um so i'm sure that you will disagree with me with what i'm about to say but there is something i dislike about the film in general and I notated that I wish there was a version of this without song. And I think that I would prefer the movie without the singing. And by that I mean every time they sing, I get taken out just a little bit. Whereas when they converse, I'm much more invested in each of the characters' uh, thought processes. And like I said, I'm sure, I'm sure you like the songs because you're, you're deep well, in right, the thing. Right, right. But uh, no, all of the songs to me are very... Like, some of them are helpful to understand things, but I just, if if I could see this in a way where they, they just talk and don't sing, I think I would be a bigger fan. I, I think part of the reason that the songs do exist... Oh, of course. ...is A is a vehicle, mm -hmm. right? It's a vehicle to keep things moving in a dialogue without a dialogue present. So, you know, you've got the scene with Oogie, and yes. he's just dancing around by himself. Well, there, if you don't understand what's going on there without any dialogue, you just see Oogie dance around in his lair, you know, you're going, you know, he sings a song about who he is. Uh, I will say that that was helpful because he right. kept being spoken about in broad terms, but I had no idea who or what an Oogie was until he told me. Right, right. <laughs> um, and I think, the other, I think one of the other things about the, the whole music in it is... I don't care who you are at any given point in your day, you've got a song rolling through your head. We're all guilty of it. We all sing a song. We whistle a song. At any given, you know, we'll be walking down a hallway and... Here it comes. Song yeah. that, right. So I think that's the other thing of it, too, which is it's just that connection of music and kind of like the eternal. I have, sure, sure. Again, I'm not... Uh, I, I knew that you would... We could have done without a couple of songs. But... <laughs> so what I was going to say, though, is... Uh... Maybe, upon further viewing, I could get into them. Uh, because almost every song, when you f hear it for the first or second time, it's not as resonating as to when you've heard it for a uh, large or right. -er amount of time. I actually think they need to change one song. What's that? I think they need to change... Uh, um, so, at the very end, where Jack and Ogie are fighting. Yes. I think they need to use Corn Coming Undone. Okay. That's <laughs> Because, fun. you know, at the end of it, Oogie comes undone. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Um, so as far as the story goes, without song, I would have given it a 4 out of 5. I think it's a good, solid story. But due to my lack of enjoyment of the songs, I gave it a 3 out of 5. I thought it was fine. And definitely something I'm willing to put on in further uh, iterations to see if it goes up in standing. But uh, I'm curious, due to your exceeding love of the film what is your grade standard because like okay so here on the channel it started out as a five star rating mm -hmm. but we have gotten up to seven stars which i call perfection now i don't know if that is your actual feelings but uh six out of five stars that's spectacular and like five out of five is great but, i mean uh, i would have to say it's at least five and a half okay like, there you go. I, don't, I don't think it's perfection Okay. Um, because yeah, like you said, you get to change out that song. Well, and here's another fun thing. I'm gonna say this real quick before you give your well, answer. If somebody would edit new songs into this, I'm willing to give that a shot. Hilarious. Right? That would that would be so. Right, fun. There's so many songs that could be edited into certain little <laughs> yeah, sections. Yeah, just of for this. funsies. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to give that a go. Um, <laughs> I just I don't think that perfection ever actually exists in most movies. Okay. Because. Okay. Even, you know, directors themselves go, I really wish I would have done this. Exactly. It's not exactly the vision that I had, you know. Yes. And there, there are going to be those imperfections. For sure. You know, 
Um, and sometimes the imperfections make perfection out of it. I know, right? You know. Yeah. Um, so you, generally speaking, when I give something a perfect score, it's because I have such an emotional attachment mm-hmm. that I can't even be unbiased. Right. And see, like, I exist in that in certain things. For sure. You know, um, especially like when we do our reviews on whiskeys and stuff. Like our our top is five. Oh yeah, yeah. And there are some that I just go, sorry, that's that's, you know. I gotta have it. Yep. That's uh, it, it has to stay in my in my bar, you know. Love it. So that's good. That's good. Um, but yeah, so you said five and a half. Five and a half. Yeah. yeah. Five and a half. Well, thank you for coming back, Ted. We will, de- we will definitely have to figure out what is uh, next for you to think on because um, well, we're gonna have it's, to figure out what's next for you to drink on. Drink on. <laughs> exactly. I like that. That's a lot of fun. But uh, thanks for tuning in. Come back Tuesday and Thursday for trivia, and see you on Friday for another long-form video. Slancha.